Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> well, today we're going to continue in Romans, Romans 7. And I'm excited about this. The Lord uh, is faithful and he pours out uh, understanding in his word. And uh, I was uh, studying and uh, just seeing things as I have never seen them before. And uh, I, uh, I began to study Romans 1988, just a couple years ago, you know. <laughs> uh, I was a little younger than I am today, just, you know, not, not a lot, but just a little bit. <laughs> and... Uh, and I remember, I remember coming out of the Bible college and still feeling that I did not have a, a grasp on Romans 6 and 7 as I really wanted to, as I knew was important. And uh, I felt like right after Bible school is when I was ready to go in Bible, into Bible school. I was ready to study the Bible just as they said that I, I was done studying the Bible. So, uh, <laughs> And so um, now, of course, uh, the Lord keeps adding more and more understanding to his word. And as I was studying for this, I really felt like uh, he was giving me some, something special to pass on to you in the context that we have been talking about. Uh, Romans, as we have said, has this theme of accepting one another, accepting Jew, accept Gentile, and Gentile, accept Jews. And for that, implies an understanding of each other and a support in each other's role as God has called each one. And so last week we were in the first uh, six verses of Romans 7. I'm not going to get into that today, but uh, uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. Uh, what we said last week, you can, you can find it on, on our website, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube page. But it had to do with the issue of being dead to the law, dead to the law, as we, we, we went to Ephesians 2 in order to understand Romans 7. And Ephesians 2 says that the law was abolished. Romans 7 says that you've died to the law. But we understood that when Paul speaks of the law, you have to understand in context whether he means only the written Torah or he is speaking of the, the law of commandments given by men around the Torah. That is called the, the oral Torah in Judaism. And because he uses that word dogma in, in uh, Ephesians 2, then we understand that he's speaking of man-made commandments. Just like the way uh, Yeshua confronted these man-made commandments we see it in, in, in the approach to him and, and the question of, you know, why, why do you not teach your disciples to do this or to do that? And that was the expectation of anyone that would, that would stand up and, and teach in the first century. But he did something different. He decided intentionally to not place his disciples under the authority of rabbinic uh, tradition. This is a matter of measure, though. It's not a matter of all or nothing, but it's a matter of measure because he himself observed many traditions. You know, we're coming still off the heels of, of our Passover Seder. You couldn't do Passover Seder if you, if you set out to to not observe an ounce of tradition, then you wouldn't be able to observe 
Passover Seder in any way that is recognizable even to Yeshua himself. You will be a lone wolf. You know, there are many out there. I had someone contact me uh, right before Passover asking me, how do we know it is the right date? Since you have to look at the moon and you have to determine, and, and, and it's like, no, this is not how it's done. These commandments, this Torah was given to Israel. And you have to, as a, as a Gentile, uh, even as a believer, you have to come in agreement in solidarity with the Jewish people. Um, because that's who God has given the, the, the responsibility to decide uh, these matters of the Torah. And if they are wrong, they are wrong before God. And as a community, it is the exception, not the rule. This is the decision that the early church made. They decided we will not depend on the Jewish people to determine when to observe, uh, when to celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. So they, they took out a different date. That's why Easter, as it is called, uh, hardly ever falls on the same calendar, calendar days as Passover. Because they decided intentionally, and it is written, that they would not follow the Jewish people in the determinations of the calendar. That is a cutting off of yourself from the people that God has established and sanctified to represent him and, and to whom he has given uh, the Torah as a responsibility. We, we sang that uh, just a few minutes ago. This is the Torah that God gave to the people of Israel through, through the hand of Moses. And it is to the people of Israel that was given. But in that process, although necessary to determine what the commandments are, what they mean, and how to observe them, you know, suppose that you want to write these words on the doorpost of your house. How are you going to do that? Well, there's a number of ways that you can do that. You can literally write it, take a, a pen and pencil marker and, and write it on the actual doorpost of your house. But the people of Israel from ancient times made a decision that this is how we're going to do it all together as a community. That is the way that, that is the authority that God has given the Jewish people to make those determinations, those decisions. The problem is that tradition becomes obsessive and excessive. And so now then the problem we have is that when Gentiles come into the faith and they discover this, the beauty of the Word of God, the whole Word of God, the Torah of God, then it is very easy to confuse what is written to what is spoken to the decisions on how we are going to observe these commandments. But we have a great example in Yeshua. When he was asked, why do you not teach your disciples to eat, uh, to wash their hands before they eat? He refused. He refused. He was not going to follow those particular traditions, those particular commandments. And he denounced those who would cancel the word of God for the sake of the traditions, for the sake of man-made commandments. That's what we are talking about here. It is, uh, those issues are, those issues are, is what Paul is addressing in the majority of his writings. And Romans is included in that. So here in Romans, uh, as we read about the, the Torah and the role of the Torah and, and the purposes for which it was given, we need to keep in mind that that is the context in which uh, these things are, are said. So come with me to verse 7 in chapter 7, Romans 7, 7. And I have a message for you 
it is, uh, I, I, try to, uh, I try to title my messages in ways that can give you a handle to the whole passage. And the more I studied this passage, the more I, un- the more I understood that this is speaking about freedom from the flesh. Freedom from the flesh. And as we work our way towards the end, we're going to see that this is what he is building towards. He is laying the foundation. He's not going to be done with this subject in chapter 7 because chapter 8 is integral to this section of chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8. But he, at the end of 7, he's going to lay the foundation for uh, this freedom from the flesh. So we're going to pick it, up, pick it up in verse 7. Verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. But not only may it never be, but on the contrary. He, uh, he uses this phrase all throughout uh, Romans, may it never be. He asks a question, and then he says, may it never be. But here he adds, on the contrary. Let me tell you this, it is actually the opposite. And and he says, I would not have come to no sin except through the Torah. And he's going to give an example. For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, you shall not covet. This is how we know that he is speaking here of the written Torah. He is actually quoting the Ten Commandments. He's quoting Exodus 20. So then we have to deal with this statement. I would not have come, I would never come to know sin except through the Torah. So it is important, it is imperative that we understand that this is one of the purposes for which the Torah was given. It is not a bad thing. We're not speaking evil of the Torah when we acknowledge that, the, that one of the purposes for which the Torah was given was to illuminate, to shed light into what sin is. Not only the details of what sin is, but the extent to which we practice sin the extent to which we are sinful. Uh, earlier this morning, we were uh, studying in Leviticus. We were studying chapter 5 in the beginning of 6. And we were talking there about the reparation offering, otherwise known as sin off- uh, sorry, uh, uh, guilt offering. So we, we kind of changed the name. You know, if you, if you want to catch up with how we change these names and what we're saying in, in Leviticus... Uh, come, 11.30, we, we have coffee, we have, we have fruit out there, we have, <laughs> we're ready for you to come. And come and partake of this feast uh, as we go through the Torah uh, in detail. But in that chapter in, in uh, Leviticus 5, 5 and 6, in the context of the reparation offering, the guilt offering, we see some very specific ways in which Uh, not only do we sin, but in which the Lord addresses our sin. He had to give the Torah and the commandments in the Torah in in order for us to understand our sin problem so that we may come to him and and, uh, benefit from the provision through the, the sacrifices that he made at the time, that he provided at the time, and that are examples of Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross for us. So we were able to understand um, in more detail how Yeshua's sacrifice applies to their specific sins uh, by the studying of, of the Torah. So this is one of the functions, one of the purposes for the Lord giving uh, the giving of the Torah. And it is imperative that we understand, that we acknowledge, that we, that we make room for that function of the Torah in our theology. Um, 
because God's purpose are seen uh, more in detail that way. You know, imagine God giving the Torah, Exodus 19 and 20, and then realizing, oh my goodness, what, what have I done? Now these people are going to sin even more. I, I can't take it back. What do I do? <laughs> Definitely not. That did not happen. He knew before the giving of the Torah that it was going to lead to more sin. Why didn't he stop it then? Well, number one, because the sin problem is not a Torah problem. The sin problem is a flesh problem. But it had to come out in order for him to address it. It had to manifest in order for him to uh, justly bring a charge and then die for the redemption of those who were charged as sinners, us. So this, the giving of the Torah and the purpose, the function of the Torah in revealing the sin and how sinful we are is exactly what the patient needed <laughs> in order for them to, for us to cry out for the solution, for God's remedy to our sin problem. So we, we must make room in our theology for this function of the Torah of revealing sin. But as we do that, we have to we have to understand that when we say Torah, there's the boundary between written Torah and oral Torah is very, very hardly, uh, hardly noticeable. But we must understand when that shift takes place. Because if the giving of the Torah results in more sin on our part, right? The more you tell me no, don't eat this cookie, don't drink that soda, don't, you know, the more don'ts, the more I want to do. <laughs> so, wouldn't it be wise if we can limit the number of commandments then? <laughs> the number of prohibitions. I think it would help me if we keep it to, to a bare minimum. Otherwise, I get more in trouble. So, it makes sense that the Lord will limit the commandments not only to what is written, but that we, in his wisdom, understand that the commandments of men that are meant to protect the Torah actually add more uh, incentive to my flesh to sin and rebel and to experience more guilt and more death. It is contrary to the intent of God to add more man-made commandments. There is a place and there is the need to explain the commandments. There is the need to come to agreement as a community as to how we are going to observe those commandments. But we have to keep that to a limit and not uh, incentivize the proliferation of man-made commandments because it is counterproductive to our spiritual walk. It is not a spiritual thing to, to become enamored with the rabbinic commandments because it is, it is contrary to the purposes of God for me to walk in freedom from my flesh. We have to make room for that as well. For the function of the Torah, one of the functions of the Torah in showing me my sin, but placing a limit to the Jewish traditions that would add, if I'm not careful, to the occasions for my sin 
to manifest rebellion against God. So this takes theological maturity. It takes sophistication, if I may say it that way. We cannot be naive or children. We have to wrestle with the text and understand all the nuances of the Jewish world, of the Word of God, and of the spiritual walk, and of the teaching of the apostles um, and Yeshua and, and through the inspiration of the Spirit. So he says, uh, For I would not have known about coveting if the Torah had not said, You shall not covet. But, he continues in verse 8, But sin... Now he's going to explain what we just talked about. Sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. Sin took opportunity of the commandment to produce in me more and more coveting. So the giving of the commandment was taken advantage of by sin in order to produce more sin in me. Do you see how it would be wise to limit the amount of commandments to only those commandments that God actually gave instead of adding man-made commandments that are going to trip me up and produce more coveting in me? Sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For, and here's a, a difficult phrase, apart from the Torah, sin is dead. This is a principle that he is giving. Apart from the Torah, sin is dead. If you think about this, and you understand from this, from this uh, statement here, that it would be good for us to be apart from the Torah, then you're understanding it correctly. It's a dangerous thought. We who have come to appreciate the Torah of God, we don't want to speak in those terms. We, you know, apart from the Torah, sin is dead. I need sin to be dead in my life. And Paul seems to be saying, well, the way to get there is by considering yourself apart from the Torah. Wow. What do we do with that now? How can we stay positive about the Torah with such statement coming from Paul? This is why so many people trip on Paul's theology. And they don't like Paul. Well, he states this as a, as a principle first. And then in verse 9... He seems to refer to this as, as some event either in his life or perhaps uh, as a representation of humanity. Read it with me, verse 9. I was once alive apart from the Torah. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. It seems to be saying... If, we wouldn't have, if you wouldn't have given that commandment, I will still be alive. <laughs> That's not the right conclusion, though. The problem is not the commandment. The problem is my flesh. The response to the stimulation of sin. But sin, we have to admit that sin takes advantage of the commandment. And it turns a good thing into a very bad thing for me, into death for me. But we have to accept this statement. That I was once alive apart from the Torah, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. This is, this is what we see in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. The moment that the commandment was given, to not eat from the fruit, sin and Satan took advantage 
and they sin. It produced in them the desire, and they acted on it. Verse 10, it says, This commandment, which was to result in life, this is the, the original intent that God had for the commandments, to result in life, and it will be so in the future. These commandments, they will result in life. Uh, remember when we pray, blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments. Sanctif sanctification through the commandments. That's what this is saying. This commandment, which was to result in life, remember, to sanctify is to infuse with life so that you are overflowing with life. That is holiness. That is sanctification. So this commandment, which was to result in life, in sanctification for me, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. He's repeating it in several different ways. So then, verse 12, the Torah is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It is not the fault of the Torah or of the commandments that sin has taken advantage and produced death in me. He is vindicating the Torah. He is defending the Torah but at the same time explaining that there is a function that the Torah has, which is to, to shed the light, to turn the lights on so that I may see how sinful I truly am, so that I may come to him for his solution. So I ask again, if sin uses... Uh, the commandments of the Torah to awaken in me the flesh and, and, and to bring me to death, why would I add more commandments? Why add more uh, reasons for my flesh to want to rebel, to want to do that which you are forbidden? We have enough. God has given us enough commandments to humble ourselves and seek his help. We don't need any more. We don't need any more. That's, that's how he's addressing the, the oral law here, the oral Torah. In verse 13... He's going to give us, uh, he's going to bring all of this to a conclusion. So he's going to give us a statement of conclusion that then he is going to explain. So verse 13 says, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? And the answer is, may never be. Absolutely not. But there are some things to explain here. Because the question is very thought-provoking, right? Did that which was good become a cause of death for me? No, but how? Well, rather, it was sin. In order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good, which is the commandment, the Torah, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. A little repetitious. But again, it's that, that principle that you have to, God had to establish the Torah and have his people commit to it so that humility may come through the fact that they will realize we can't do this. We need your righteousness. We have none in and of ourselves. 
So that's a, a preliminary conclusion that he arrives at. But now he's going to defend it. He's going to explain. In verse 14, he says, for, that's code for Paul is, here's the explanation of what I just said. For, we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. So, in other words, in verse 13, right, the Torah is good, but sin took advantage of it. Sin caused death. The explanation is that the law is spiritual, the Torah is spiritual in verse 14, but I am a flesh. That's the problem. I vindicate the Torah, but I'm beginning to shed light onto the real, the real problem is that I am a flesh. I have a human body that has not yet been redeemed, that has a, a tendency to sin, and it cannot be helped. That's the problem. Verse 15, he continues with the explanation. He continues to elaborate, so to speak. He says, for what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. You know, this happened to me last night. I was watching my baseball game, you know, Shabbat started, we're just relaxing, and then all of a sudden, I get the cravings. Oh, here we go again. I'd already had my dinner, should have been satisfied. Why do I eat the things that I don't want to eat? <laughs> Here's the thing. When he speaks of the flesh, when he speaks of the body, he is, he is referring to the desires of the flesh. And there's a similarity here between the desires of the flesh and the function of Jewish tradition. Right? We've said Jewish tradition is necessary but becomes excessive. That's what happens to, with the, the human desires, the fleshly desires, the desires of my body. It is not bad to be hungry. In fact, God made us this way. We need to eat, and he put the hunger in us so that we wouldn't be foolish and try to go without eating. The problem is not in eating or even wanting to eat, the problem is that it becomes excessive. Because I'm not satisfied with, you know, just a couple of cookies. Uh. <laughs> i got to have more and more. And, you know, same thing with the area of sex. Sex in and of itself is a gift from God. It's a gift for, for intimacy. And, and in fact, he calls it a mystery that reflects the union between Yeshua and us, his body, his bride. Yet we know that in excess and outside of the restrictions that God has given us, it becomes a very bad thing. It becomes perverted, and it brings death. So the body, the, the desires of the, of the flesh are a problem because they are excessive, they are compulsive, and they know no end. That's my problem. So when Paul says, I, I do the things I don't want to do, and what I do want to do, I lack the power to do it in a, in a consistent basis. You know, that's part of the problem of the man-made commandments of tradition, that they can, they can make you look good for a while. They can make you look religious in front of some people. 
But did you know that internet pornography among Orthodox Jews in Israel is a rabid problem? Rampant. Internet pornography among religious Jews in Israel. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Tradition can make you look good for a while. It can make you look good in front of some people. But it lacks the power to truly produce righteousness because of the flesh. And the more that you add, the more commandments that you add, the more that the flesh is going to use that as a way to rebel against God because it cannot help it. This is who we are. This is we, who we've become. So, 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. Verse 16. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the Torah. Confessing that the Torah is good. Again, the Torah is vindicated. He arrived at the conclusion that the Torah is good, but sin brings death. And the explanation is that the Torah is, uh, is good because it is spiritual. But I am not. I am fleshly. And I have these desires that go against the commandments of the Torah. So in verse 17, he arrives at, a, at the next phase of his explanation, the next conclusion. He says, verse 17, so now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. No longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So he begins to, to make a distinction here that, re again, requires, it requires maturity. It requires theological maturity and it requires emotional maturity. Because he's saying, in, in a way he's saying, it is not me. It is sin, that, the sin that is in me. Yet, I am responsible so in a way, it is me. You know, you can't go uh, uh, to, to, you can't tell the policeman that stops you for going 80 on a 50 and tell him, sir, it wasn't me. It was the sin that dwells in me. Well, how about we take your sin and you <laughs> uh, into custody? <laughs> so can't use that as an excuse, but we must understand the difference in order to understand the, the solution that God has provided. Again, he says, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. And now he's going to explain it, right? He made a bold statement. He's going to explain it now in verse 18. He says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Remember the definition of the word good? Yeah, we talk, we talk a lot about good and evil here, here in Sukkot. Genesis 1. And God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was very good. What was good? The, the land that he just created, Genesis 1. It was good because it was fruitful. So good is that which makes you and me fruitful, which makes the land fruitful. You are the land. I am the land, right? Yeshua said, the seed is the word of God, and it goes into the heart of man because we are the land, and it produces fruit. So good is that which makes you and me fruitful. So Paul is saying, I know that in me, the capacity to make myself fruitful 
is lacking. I do not have this capacity in me. Nothing good dwells in me. In it, uh, in me, in and of myself. And he, and he specifies in my flesh. In my flesh. For, he's going to further explain, the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. The doing is the capacity to do it, the strength to do it, the power to do it. I have the desire, but I, I really can't make it into a reality on a consistent basis, uh, in a spiritual way, and not just outwardly. I can't do it. It won't happen. It will not measure the standard, the standard of God. The willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Verse 19, he continues the explanation. Now he says, for the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. Good and evil. Good is that which makes you and me fruitful. Evil is exactly the opposite. You know, evil isn't just uh, something immoral. Evil is whatever does not make me fruitful. It could be a good thing. It could be something that our culture says is good. It could be something that your family says is good. But if it does not make me fruitful, then it is evil for me. It is the spirit of it. Not just the letter. So, the good that I want, the fruitfulness that I desire, I can produce it. Because I practice, I can only practice things that actually make me unfruitful. Even though I don't want to. Verse 20. But if I am... Doing the very thing I do not want, I am, no longer the one, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. So again, I have to make this distinction and this differentiation that there are these two ent entities in me. One that desires fruitfulness and one that cannot do fruitfulness. Verse 21, he's going to give us now uh, another set of conclusions. Look in verse 21, he says, I find, so these are his findings, right? You've been thinking and meditating and reading and studying, and now you have some findings. You, you want to share what you've found. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, but the word principle it's the same word for Torah in the Greek. Well, <laughs> the problem is that in the Greek, it can also mean principle. So it's a good translation here. A law. You know, we use the word law for principle. So I find, these are my findings, I find the principle, the, 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 the principle that evil, that which is not fruitful, is present in me, the one who wants to do good, even though I want to do good. Verse 22. For, he's going to explain that, I joyfully concur with the Torah of God in the inner man, but I see a different principle, a different law in the members of my body. What are the members of my body? I see a different principle in the members of my body. You know, the members of my body will be my mouth. There's a different principle in my mouth. There's a different principle in my eyes. There's a different principle in my feet and my hands. I don't understand it. My feet, they take me all the way to the pantry. And my hands, they grab these, you know, the cookies for me. I, I don't understand it. 
They are doing things I don't want to do. They put it in my mouth and my teeth, they begin to chew. How does that happen? <laughs> Man, I feel betrayed. <laughs> it's this body of mine. See, the members of my body, my body parts, there is a principle in them that and that principle is to do that which is not fruitful for me. I see a different principle in the members of my body, in my flesh, waging war against the law of my mind, the principle that is in my mind that comes from the Torah of God, in the inner man, the desire to do good is waging war against this and making me a prisoner making me a prisoner of this principle of sin, of this unfruitfulness that is in me, which is in the members, in my flesh. This is deep uh, anthropology. This is a psychological aspect of humanity that you cannot find in secular anthropology or psychology. These are aspects of the human being and especially of one who has been born again, that has these new capacities. They're deep, they're deeply spiritual. Friends, the man-made commandments of external appearance they have, they have no business here. They cannot do a thing to, to redeem me from this strong tendency, these principles in the members of my body. There's nothing that can be done. There's nothing that man can do to contain these, these forces. That's why he says in verse 24, wretched man that I am. This word wretched, it means, it's a, it's a compound word. It means to, to bear an experience. In other words, to live under the burden of what I experience every day. To be a prisoner of it, and I can't get out of it. And he says, who will set me free from the body of this death? This is kind of an awkward translation. The body of this death. The body of this, this mortal body. <laughs> That's what that means. This human body that is decaying, that does not know life. And you may say, but aren't we redeemed and resurrected with Messiah? We, we study that in Romans 6. Yes, but that's the inner man. The flesh has not been transformed and redeemed yet. It will be. It's like a, a personal Canaanite that God has left around me, <laughs> the me that's inside. He's left this body like a Canaanite in the land so that I may learn to do battle and learn to tap into the power of God, what he has provided for victory. Because he says, who will set me free? This is what I need. I need freedom from this body, from the members of this body, from the hands and the feet, from the mouth and the teeth. I need freedom from these guys. I need a new body. In the meantime, in the meantime, he says, thanks be to God through Yeshua the Messiah, our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, I'm serving the Torah of God because I have a desire to do the Torah of God. But on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. If I follow uh, the desires of my flesh, I'm going to be a slave of sin. But if I 
through the provision of Yeshua. That's why he says, thanks be to God for what, had, what Yeshua has done. So this becomes the foundation of what he's going to say in Romans 8. And you're going to have to come back next week <laughs> to continue with Romans 8. So Romans 7, the movie ends, but there's another chapter. So we have to wait until next week for the next episode or the next season. Wait for a few months until the next season comes back on. And, <laughs> and we want now, we want to know what happens here. But we have enough here. We have the foundations of God's solution for our life in this earthly body. We have the foundations. And so in chapter 8, he's going to take these foundations and he's going to join it with the power of God. Because that's what we lack. We lack the power. We have, we've been redeemed. So in the inner man, we have the desire for the Torah of God. But we lack the power. Because we lack the power, the flesh comes in. And in our weakness, we do what the flesh wants. Rather than doing what the commandments wants, want. And what I want. And so what I lack is the power of God. The capacity to say no to the desires of the flesh and to say yes to the commandments of God. And that's what he's going to talk about in Romans 8. So you see how it relates uh, to the issues of rabbinic authority of Jewish, of excessive Jewish tradition. You have, you have gone way past beyond that. By the time you understand Romans 6, 7, and 8, you have matured to the level that uh, you can properly use the traditions of our people. That we have the maturity to adopt and use, but not be dominated and become excessive. That's exactly what Yeshua did. It's exactly what the apostles wrestled with, and in their maturity, they arrive at. We see Peter wrestling with those things in Acts 10 and Galatians 2. And that's, that's the maturity the Lord is bringing in us as a congregation that we may live out the message of Romans. Jew and Gentile, understand one another, understand the place of Judaism, both for Jews and for Gentiles as newcomers and those who have lived in this manner. Understand these things by going way beyond, by understanding what Yeshua has provided. It is so glorious it is so magnificent, it's so powerful that only through the ignorance of Romans 6, 8, and 9, 6, 7, and 8, can someone revert into the provisions of the traditions of men. Only through the ignorance of these deeply theological and maturing teachings. But that's not us here. That's not what we do here. We pursue this freedom from the Lord that we may worship him, that we may observe his commandments in the power that he has given us uh, based on the victory that he has provided for us. And out of this uh, maturity, we serve one another, and we serve him. And I pray for those things to increasingly become realities in our lives and in our homes. Let's pray. Father, thank you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
that you have provided this congregation at this time. You've given us in your grace this understanding of your word. This is not insignificant. This is a stewardship you have given us. And we pray that we may be faithful to you to steward this well. For this is a message that the nations need, that Israel need. And you need messengers who understand these things to teach it to those around us. As priests of God that we are, ministering to those who have need, who fall prey of the lies of the enemy, in confusing the beautiful traditions that we have that can become excessive. But those who need clarification and understanding can find it in us to whom you have given this richness of understanding and maturity in your word. Thank you. Thank you for the uniqueness of these gifts that you give to us. We pray now that you will bless us in the rest of our afternoon together.